My name is Pat Ryan. Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's new digital startup hub. Uh, we're having our third Founder Stories. Uh, we're sold out once again, and so we are videotaping it for people who aren't able to get here tonight. If you haven't seen the first two, we did uh, Grubhub founders, uh, Mike Evans and Matt Maloney, as well as uh, Open Table founder Chuck uh, Templeton. Both of those are available online. You can see them. And for anyone who misses tonight, you'll be able to see this online. But we have a real treat for you today, um, a great entrepreneur, uh, a great story, and uh, my former neighbor in our, our building, our companies were in the same building for a year, uh, Brian Johnson from Braintree. Brian, thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting. Um, so Brian, let's start with your B2B company. Uh, you've made a lot of, uh, got a lot of publicity with the uh, fundraising, people seeing your success, mm -hmm. but a lot of people may not know. What does Braintree uh, exactly do? Uh, we help online businesses accept credit card payments. And so our customers include uh, local Chicago companies like 37 Signals. We work with uh, Living Social, GitHub, Fab.com, Uber, and we power their credit card payments and um, help them accept money. Or I spend a lot more money with you than I realized. <laughs> um, so is that the business PayPal's in? Yes, we compete with PayPal. So talk a little bit about that, because you know, PayPal had a lot of publicity back from its early years. Um, Talk a little bit about what do you all do and, and, and how do you compete in that space? Because you've had incredible growth in a space that PayPal has been around since you know, the late 90s. Yeah. yeah the analogy I, I use in, in explaining this to people is that 10 years ago when you, bought a, a cell, when you bought cell phone service, you evaluated the minutes and the plan, whether it was regional or national, and then uh, text, messages, text messages and night weekend minutes. And that was the criteria. And then after you chose your plan, you then got some free Nokia or Ericsson phone. Now when you decide on mobile phone service, you decide on the phone first, the iPhone or the Android, and the network is secondary. So whether it's Sprint, AT&T, or Verizon that's backing that phone, it's really the phone and the software on that phone that matters. And that's been true in payments as well. So 10 years ago, if you would have got a merchant account, you would have talked to the merchant account providers in the back end. Now it's the software that matters. And so we make software that's relevant for our customers. And so we're, we've caught that big value shift from provider to um, the Mark, the Mark Andreessen software eating the world one vertical yeah. at a time. Yeah. Um, okay, so talk, talk a little about when did you found it? When, when the, how did the initial idea come about? Um, found yes, it? It, it's a long story, but the, the short version is that I was broke. And um, <laughs> as I guess a lot of you can relate with, <laughs> um, I was pursuing another company that I'd started, and we were two years in uh, without any money, and it wasn't a clear horizon of making money. And so uh, desperate, uh, married and with a child, I emailed the 50 richest people in where I was living, Utah, and I asked them if I could you know, come work for them as their sidekick. I told them I was young and smart and ambitious and I could just do whatever they wanted me to. Because um, I needed some flexibility to work on my other uh, business and no one responded. <laughs> You'll I'd, be I'd, one of those 50 people soon enough, so you remember when someone writes you. Uh, I then applied to you know, 20 or 30 jobs. Uh, no one was interested in talking to me, and so I couldn't find a job. And uh, so I took the only thing I could find, which was a 100% commission door-to-door -door sales job, you know, peddling credit card processing. Wow. And it was really painful. Uh, you know, going into the door, right when I walked in, you know, the owners would typically say, like, oh, you're the fourth guy today that's coming in here to try to sell me something. What do you have? And I'd say, well, you know, credit card processing would be even worse. Like, oh, every guy that comes in here, you know, takes advantage of me as this what's, so. What's the closing rate on credit card processing or even door opening rate? must be tough. Yeah, it was terrible. Um, but what I did figure out is that um, the, the credit card processing industry is this unregulated space. There's no requirements to get in the game. There's no one overseeing the, the industry. And so you had all these unscrupulous providers. It's, and it's also very complex. So people could take, take advantage of, of business owners. And uh, what I figured out is that if I could package honesty, transparency, and good customer support, that sold. And so my pitch was, I'd say, if you give me five minutes of your time, I guarantee you I'll win your business. And oftentimes it was intriguing for them to hear, like, hey, what's this guy going to offer me, right? That would be so convincing that I would say, sure, right? I would switch again. And I'd open my pitch book and I'd walk them through um, from A to Z how the industry worked, who the providers were, what they did, what they did differently. And I was just honest. And I told them how it was. We didn't really have any secret sauce as a company. It was, we had the same products everyone else did. And, and, um, was this a software company or more of a service so provider? More of a, a provider, like a network, like a Verizon or AT&T. Um, but despite that, people bought it because it was a unique pitch. And I became the company's number one salesperson. I broke all their sales records in the first part 12 months, part time. Uh, they had 400 nationwide. And it's just this formula of honesty, transparency, and good support 
and uh, it resonated with people. And so I, I started Braintree based upon that principle of doing the same thing in the online world that I was doing in the uh, card present world. And, and you know, one of the things you see people who come out of um, industries is sometimes the company starts with more of a sales and marketing element than a tech yeah. element. Well, do you guys start was tech dominant or more sales and marketing dominant? It was more sales and marketing. I had uh, I had learned on the streets how to do it, and then we. Um, Fortunately, we were introduced to OpenTable, and they had this problem where they had 11,000. How would you connect with OpenTable? I met uh, Chuck Templeton. Oh, Chuck Templeton. Yeah, the last tech most event. founder stories. What a small world. Yeah, Chuck, Chuck is in every company. I think I'll have, to have yeah. Chuck be at the Nexus. He is the Kevin Bacon of the Chicago startup scene. <laughs> um, he does great stuff, though, much better than Kevin Bacon. Yeah, he was an advisor of the company for the first two years. He's a great guy. Um, Terrific. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed working with him. And he introduced us to OpenTable. And OpenTable had this problem where they had 11,000 restaurants around the, the world. And they stored credit card data for reservations for restaurants. But they, if they did that, they had to comply with the industry standards PCI. And it was just massively complex problem they didn't want to deal with. And so they asked us if we could solve it. And of course, like any good startup would say, we said, of course we can solve that. <laughs> uh, so they, they, uh, did a, they gave us a $1.2 million contract, $90,000 up front, and we developed uh, software for them. And so, so we, an interesting conversation before I was coming over here, um, uh, and it was, it was Troy Hennikoff yeah. from Accelerate, who knew your business early on, and terrific guy. But he said he was also a, a customer at one point. Um, and he talked about it from a pain point perspective. I thought it was interesting. He said, you know, the compliance related to this mm -hmm. area, which is uh, a PCI. PCI compliance. He said it's such a pain point. And he said the idea that you can come in and say, we will take that off your plate. We will give you confidence, security, integrity, and you get a token. Yeah. And you just have to worry about the token. He said it was such a compelling pitch. Uh, and it uh, seems like you really found a pain point there. Yeah. Um, but for open table. You know, a $1.2 million contract, how much revenue did you have? Yeah, so overnight, right, we had all this money flowing through the company. And and what it, was your revenue like before you got the contract? Oh, I think it was, don't tell OpenTable this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was somewhere around fifteen, twenty thousand 20000 a month, I think, in that ballpark. Wow. Wow. And so uh, was that a moment that your, was that the moment your business model pivoted from sales and marketing? It drug? was, yeah. And I think it's true that in, in um, everyone's life, entrepreneurship or not, that we, we have these moments of opportunity and of luck. And uh, that was a big one for us. It was a turning point at Braintree. It's a turning point in my life personally. And we were, we were in the right place at the right time. And we just were very fortunate. And it changed the trajectory of Braintree. That's great. That's great. So you're a lifelong entrepreneur. I am. Um, you've had great success at Braintree. But you know, how old were you when you started your first company? Well, so I guess the um, when I was 20, 21, um, I wanted to buy a cell phone. And I, met, I didn't want to buy, uh, pay retail. I was frugal. And so I called this guy in the Yellow Pages, and I asked if we could meet at the mall. And so I met him there, and I bought the phone. And he said, you know, you're, you've got a lot of energy. Why don't you come sell phones for me? I'll pay you 40 bucks a phone. And I thought, that's great, uh, you know, instead of working an hourly job. And um, so I sold phones for him for two days. And <laughs> <laughs> you're very patient, yeah. I can tell. And then I thought, wait a second. If I'm selling phones for him, why can't people sell phones for me? And I had this thought that forever, that forever changed my life. Um, I thought those who show initiative will reap the benefits of those who won't. In other words, if I could set up the structure and I could get the phones and I could create this network, there would be 99 people be, uh, that would be willing to sell these phones. And so I hired a bunch of college students to sell phones for me. So I got a, a, a wholesaler, got the stuff from them, and then gave them to college students. I put my, my, paid my way through college without really working much. I just simply gave the phones to the salespeople, gave them incentive plans. And it was a great first business. But Tom Sawyer here. <laughs> but you know, it worked out it's well great. because I mean, in entrepreneurship, I guess I, I never understood the value of a fixed wage, like why I would trade my time for a fixed amount of money. I wanted to determine what I was worth. And if it was zero, that was fine. I was willing to accept that. If it was a million dollars, that's even better. But I wanted to determine what I was worth. And I also wanted the ability to, to author life. I think that that's one of the most beautiful concepts that I've ever uh, realized is that just like J.K. Rowling sat down and created Harry Potter, right? The world we've inhabited as we've read her book. Entrepreneurs do the same thing, right? They create the worlds they live in, the products and services they create, the people they hire, the culture they create. They are authoring life. And to have that ability, 
Uh, oftentimes in, in companies or big companies, you don't have that ability. There's so many constraints, and you, you get painted in a box on what you can and cannot do. But really, that was uh, everything aligned to, uh, for me, and I thought this was really the path I wanted to pursue. And entrepreneurship has always uh, fit like a glove with me. I, I can't imagine any other way to, uh, to live. Well, they say if, if you've been an entrepreneur a certain amount of time, a friend of mine said to me, you sell your companies, you're still unhirable. Because once people become an entrepreneur, yeah. they, they, they would never want to go back. And yeah, I you're think infected. That's true. Yeah. It is. So, but you, so you're writing the story of your life, which you've got a great opening chapter. Uh, what's the next entrepreneurial chapter for Brian Johnson? I don't know. Um, what, no, I'm sorry, after, after the cell phone company. Yeah, so um, with success under my belt, the small success of cell phones, um, I got a bigger appetite. And it, the internet um, boom was going on. And so three other gentlemen and I set out to do a voice over IP company, a lot like Vonage and Skype. And uh, we raised about a half a million dollars in funding. And we set out, we created a product, we got some customers, we started making some money. And um, we went for a second round of funding, and 9-11 happened, and it killed our ability to raise any money. But in reality, I mean, I think we did everything wrong in that company. We didn't have the right people. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have, we were you know, five years too early. I, mean, I think we just did everything wrong we could have possibly done wrong. And uh, it was a great lesson of, you know, how, um, of, I guess, a failure, right? And um, the frugality of entrepreneurship. Well, Brad, Brad Keywell uh, talks a lot about how uh, in order to be a great entrepreneurial city, Chicago has to understand how you take failure. We were, uh, we were starting on 9-11, um, rolling out September the 11th, 2001 at 10 a.m. in Washington, D.C. And I can tell you the rollout didn't go so well. Um, we just got, back, got back, back, our, back in our cars and came home. But, um, you know, survival is a hard thing, but it teaches important lessons. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a reason why I think a lot of people uh, – been through those struggles like Brad and Eric were early on. If you learn from them, they make you better. They do make you stronger. Yeah. But they should also make you decide, do you really want to be an entrepreneur? Sure. It's, when you don't show up and a year later get paid a billion dollars, you're like, wait a second, where's, where's my glamour? Yeah. And uh, as, as I think we all know, that yeah, well, not a lot of glamour. You just got to love it for the passion of it. When we were raising money for this company, um, one of the investors looked at us and they said, have you ever failed before? And we kind of turned our chin up and put our chest out and said, no. And uh, he said, I want to invest in. And I thought, how silly is that? Why would you want to invest in failures? And I mean, now it's abundantly clear to me that I just was, I had no idea what I was doing. And um, he was prudent. And he, he shouldn't have invested. He didn't. So uh, he was better off for it. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a great point. OK, so you have this VoIP company. 9-11 mm -hmm. um, happens. What's the next chapter in? Uh the Brian Johnson. Yes, I, I wanted to take a breather, uh, but my brother talked me into starting another company um, <laughs> uh, right after. We, there was this real estate developer that had come into our office on a regular basis. There were a bunch of offices in there, and he wanted to develop real estate, but didn't have any money to do it. He had a couple projects underway, and he complained all the time about his inability to raise money. And so we said, hey, like, we just raised money, right? We know how to raise money, and how easy would it be to raise money for an asset, right, instead of like this internet thing? And so we set off and we started a company and we, um, three years later, this is the real estate thing, we launched a, a $70 million mixed use project in, in Utah. Um, it was a massive project, right, in the heart of one of the best suburbs in the state. I mean, prime real estate, beautiful product, uh, project, and we messed up on the storage of the space. So we, were, we set out to sell the product and empty nester showed up, but there wasn't enough storage. And so sales stalled, the bank got ang anxious, and it just all fell apart. And um, that was also the same time I was out in the street selling credit card processing. But, you know, a small success with a cell phone and then two massive failures uh, right after that.